Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Sebastian Kasu. I'm an intensivist and emergency physician and today I want to talk with you about a simplified treatment algorithm for the management of trauma-induced hemorrhage without viscoelastic testing. Please note my conflicts of interest. First of all, I have to say that I'm convinced that point-of-care guided coagulation management is state-of-the-art. We get fast the main information about clotting time, clotting formation, clot stability depending on various influencing factors and when we use all given possibilities we can get good information about platelet function. This results in a complete change of the coagulation management. In my opinion you can see these changes very good in this study. Stein and colleagues showed the differences in transfusion of allogenic blood products and outcome between two cohorts. The standard care group before implementing point of care guided management and the goal directed coagulation management group. They observed not only a reduction of given blood products like packed red blood cells and plasma, but a kind of optimization of coagulation management in the first 24 hours. Whereas platelets and Fibrinogen showed no significant differences. Tranexamic acid and PCC has been applied significantly more often in the goal-directed coagulation management group. Additionally, there is a significant reduction of ICU stay, ventilator support, and mortality rate in the first 24 hours. So it seems to be that goal-directed therapy is helpful to avoid overuse of blood products, especially PRBCs and plasma. And this is a very important information because we do know that overuse of blood products can be very harmful. If point-of-care coagulation management is not available, standard laboratory tests are used. With these standard tests we measure time. The time until coagulation begins in the test tube. And additionally, we look at platelet count, but nothing more and nothing less. Apart from the fact that these test results give no information about clot formation or stability, it requires up to one hour for the results. And this is too much time to treat bleeding patients in the emergency room immediately. The consequence in the emergency management is that traditional blood components are used in the hope to get a kind of magic mixture. Please let me describe a little bit more detailed what I mean. With traditional blood components, we try to restore a kind of whole blood. This is based on packed red blood cells, plasma and platelets. In history, we used to follow this concept because there were no or just little alternatives. Well, the truth is that there is no magic mixture. There is no perfect ratio of packed red blood cells, plasma and platelets. The manufacturing process of separating donated blood into single components necessitates the addition of stabilizers and nutritional solutions to facilitate storage and inhibit coagulation. Even prepared whole blood is diluted. Ponchap and colleagues published this study in 2015. They tried to restore whole blood with different variations of blood components but without using factor concentrates. They showed that reconstitution of whole blood in a ratio of 1 to 1 to 1 resulted in significant dilution of the hematocrit and platelet count. And very important for me were the data in relation to fibrinogen because of its key role in initial coagulation management. In this study, the fibrinogen content of reconstituted whole blood ranged between 1.5 and 1.9 gram per liters, depending on the plasma variant used for reconstitution. This means that the observed fibrinogen content of the therapeutic is already within the limits of the threshold values for fibrinogen supplementation for bleeding patients as suggested by recent European guidelines. And it's impossible to reach the recommended upper fibrinogen thresholds of 2 gram per liters by transfusion of reconstituted whole blood alone if plasma fibrinogen concentration in the patient is already low. In addition, if the plasma fibrinogen of our patient is high, transfusion of reconstituted blood might result in further dilution. 
in conclusion, reconstitution of whole blood in a one to one to one ratio resulted in significant dilution of the hematocrit and platelet count. These results are supported by data from Kahn and colleagues. In this international prospective cohort study of bleeding trauma patients at three trauma centers, a blood sample was drawn immediately on arrival and after four, eight and 12 packed red blood cell transfusions. Fresh frozen plasma, platelet and cryoprecipitate use was recorded during these intervals. On admission, 40% of the patients were coagulopathic. This increased to nearly 60% after four PRBCs and to 80% after eight PRBCs. Early replacement of increasing doses of plasma and average doses of other blood component therapy had little effect on the deranged rotum coagulation parameters or coagulation factor concentration during the acute phase of care. On average, all functional coagulation parameters and procoagulant factor concentrates deteriorated during hemorrhage and there was no clear benefit to high dose fresh frozen plasma strategy in any parameter. Only combined high dose plasma, cryo and platelet therapy with a high total fibrinogen load appeared to produce a consistent improvement in coagulation. We not only know that transfusion of fresh frozen plasma for mild abnormalities of coagulation values fails to correct the prothrombin time in 99% of patients, but we also know that we need high doses of plasma to affect a significant increment of coagulation factors. This study assessed the effect on coagulation tests of FFP given in smaller doses compared with higher doses in critical ill patients. Group 1 received approximately 12 ml per kilogram and group 2 30 ml per kilogram fresh resin plasma. Prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time and factors 1 to 12 were measured before and after plasma infusion. Factor levels of 30 units or only 1 gram per liter for fibrinogen were considered hemostatic. What we saw was that high doses of plasma were needed to get a significant increment of coagulation factors. Or, in other words, we need 3 liters of plasma to get a significant increment of coagulation factors in a bleeding patient weighing 100 kg. And beside the fact that these high volumes are associated with a lot of side effects, we do have a big time matter. Prompt was a prospective multicenter observational cohort study conducted at 10 level 1 trauma centers in the United States. They hypothesized that early transfusion of plasma and platelets in higher ratios would be associated with decreased in hospital mortality in bleeding patients. The data collection was begun upon arrival in the emergency department and patients were included if they required the highest level of trauma activation and were transfused at least one unit of PRBCs in the first six hours after admission. For me, one of the most interesting results was the time between admission and the beginning of plasma transfusion. Therefore, they needed in median 69 minutes in this study. Too much time if the patient really has a relevant bleeding issue. Okay, so in conclusion there is no magic mixture. No perfect ratio of single blood components to restore whole blood. And we do know that point-of-care guided coagulation management could avoid an overuse of blood products, what is very important, because we do know that blood products themselves could be harmful. Standard laboratory tests need too much time for an initial coagulation management, and it seems to be that there are little experiences in data in concentrate-based management without point-of-care testing, and this is our dilemma. Of course, there's no perfect solution, and point-of-care guided coagulation management should be used, there's no doubt. However, 
hospitals and medical staff in the emergency department without the possibility of point of care testing are interested in effective blood and coagulation management too. For me, one of the main principles to support a best possible care is to provide a good standard protocol. Such protocols should be immediately and easy to use by everyone, even the youngest colleagues in the night shift at 4 a.m. And they should include fast and objective criteria for the management. They should include concentrate-based management because we do know that there's no magic mixture. And last but not least, it should be adapted to the individual possibilities of the hospital where the protocol is provided. The protocol I want to show you today has a simple structure. It's colored, very simple and was made to be understood and used by everyone in the emergency department. It goes into the basics, involves aspects of hyperfibrinolysis, supports a fast substitution of factor concentrates and addresses the case of massive blood transfusion. The first step is to remember the basic management. This of course not only includes oxygen and fluid management, but also laboratory testing, logistics for further diagnostics, therapy and transport, and a correct pH over 7.2, a good body temperature and calcium. The next step is to remember the medical team to ask some really essential questions. Is there an antidote therapy possible? Do we know anything about the patient's medication, like antiplatelet agents or an oral anticoagulation? Do we note an increased bleeding tendency? If so, we should draw consequences immediately. We are also remembered to ask ourselves if the patient already got tranexamic acid. In case of massive bleeding following trauma, TXA could be a life-saving drug. If the patient did not get tranexamic acid, it should be provided within the very first three hours after trauma. While these first steps of the protocol were simple to create, fibrinogen supplementation was a kind of challenge. And for me, it's the main part of this protocol. Let me explain why I had my trouble with this. Very often you can read that fibrinogen should be given in dependence of the patient's weight, like 30 to 40 or 50 milligram per kilogram. But I do have my problems with that. And I want to tell you why. Imagine I have a colleague. He is as tall as I am, but he weights twice as much as I do. And now imagine we both are sitting in the same car, having the same accident with the same speed and we collide with the same tree beside the street. We do have the same injuries and a massive bleeding following trauma. Now we get transported by EMS into the same emergency department, into the same emergency room, and my colleague with the same injuries gets twice as much fibrinogen as I would get in this scenario. You might understand that I'm totally not enthusiastic with this kind of management. Well, to solve this and keeping in mind that there is no magic mixture in our efforts to reconstitute whole blood with PRBC's plasma and platelets, Let's look at the main aspects of fibrinogen. Fibrinogen deficiency develops early after major blood loss because there's no depot in the human body and low fibrinogen levels are a strong and independent risk factor for death after injury in patients requiring a massive transfusion. So we need to set our focus on fibrinogen concentrate or cryo because we cannot achieve needed fibrinogen levels with plasma but we don't know fibrinogen levels within the very first hour without point of care testing. Last but not least we don't have an official and clear concept for a differentiated dose finding but just the recommendation to give fibrinogen independence of body weight. And I'm not happy with this recommendation because it disregards the extent of bleeding. So it makes totally sense to search for information about the fibrogen level which could be used immediately for initial coagulation management in the emergency room.
So the question is, how can we get close to the above mentioned aspects and solve these issues in consideration of our possibilities and without point of care testing? Well, we were not the only ones who asked this question. Gauss and colleagues postulated that early recognition of low fibrinogen concentrations in trauma patients is crucial for timely hemostatic treatment and laboratory testing is too slow to inform decision making. So they published a retrospective cohort study and developed a simple clinical tool to predict low fibrinogen concentrations in trauma patients on arrival in the emergency department. They constructed a clinical score, the fibrinogen on admission in trauma score to predict fibrinogen plasma concentration of 1.5 gram per liters or less with the factors shown in this slide. It not only includes the patient's age and vital parameters like heart rate, systolic blood pressure or body temperature, but also the hemoglobin difference in out-of-hospital setting and at the time of admission. In conclusion, this fibrinogen score accurately predicted plasma fibrinogen levels of 1.5 gram per liters or less on admission in trauma patients with 5 or more than 5 points. It is easy to use and could allow early goal-directed therapy to trauma patients without point-of-care technique. But in daily practice, it is again an additional score and, for example, we in Germany do not have the possibility to measure hemoglobin in pre-hospital settings, so we are not able to interpret the hemoglobin difference between the time with out-of-hospital management and admission in the emergency department. Anyway, we had to find another concept. In search of a smart solution for our protocol, we found this study. Dunham and colleagues published a retrospective analysis and classified adult trauma patients into four shock classes depending on base deficit. They compared different outcomes with traditionally known shock classes of ATLS, the International Accepted Advanced Trauma Life Support. Over 1,800 patients were included and in conclusion, base deficit appeared to be superior to ATLS-based vital signs in the immediate assessment of trauma patients. Interesting was not only a better correlation with the mortality rate in the study, but also a significant correlation with the use of blood products in a study from Mutschler and colleagues who used the same kind of classification into four shock classes depending on the base deficit as shown on this slide. Well, to follow these thoughts with base deficit, I also want to show you this paper from Christoph Schlimp and colleagues published in 2013. We used these informations in combination with our knowledge from the other data to develop our concept. In this retrospective study with nearly 700 trauma patients, fibrinogen was correlated with hemoglobin, base excess and ISS alone and in combination using regression analysis. It was shown that more negative base excess was associated with lower fibrinogen levels. Of course, the same observations were made with hemoglobin. And hemoglobin and base deficit in combination showed a quite good correlation with fibrinogen levels at admission in the emergency department after trauma. We decided to go one step further and to integrate these findings into our concept. Blood gas analyses are an integral part of daily emergency medicine and available in most of our emergency departments. Everyone knows how to handle the technique and the given results. It's fast and no additional management is needed because in the emergency room at least one blood gas analysis is a fixed part of emergency management in bleeding situations anyway. As you can see, we show in our protocol the suggested fibrinogen doses independence of hemoglobin and base deficit. And this concept is integrated as a kind of centerpiece in the overview on the backside of the algorithm. After ensuring an adequate fibrinogen level, the next step of this protocol focuses on prothrombin complex concentrate. 
not only the included coagulation factors, but the following thrombin burst could be life-saving in acute bleeding situations. On the other hand, there is the risk of thromboembolic events, especially if PCC doses are too high. We searched current data with PCC, hemoglobin and base deficit because we wanted to integrate PCC doses in our shown dosing concept, but until today there are no studies with convincing results. So we decided to suggest 25 units per kilogram if the patient is still bleeding in this stage of management. Well, until now, the team using this protocol ensured the basics. They maintained a good pH, a good body temperature and calcium. They included the medical history and current therapeutic options, considered tranexamic acid and also ensured a fast and consequent concentrate-based coagulation management with fibrinogen and PCC as shown in the last minutes. These basics are fundamental if the patient is still bleeding and a massive transfusion is indicated. In this case, early application of packed red blood cells in dependence of the clinical situation and hemoglobin levels combined with plasma and platelets in a ratio of at least 1 to 1 to 1 is suggested. The front side of this protocol also shows some aspects of management including an ultimate ratio concept. but. At the end, it tries not to leave a certain simplicity for the healthcare member and to point out that the right order of the different steps in coagulation management are essential. Yes, this protocol has limitations. Of course it has. It's only useful for the initial coagulation management. You cannot use these concepts in the operating theater, for example, after four hours with different coagulation management and a lot of plasma and PRBCs. And we are still blind in many aspects. And you have to know that this protocol is not validated until yet. However, using this protocol in the treatment of bleeding patients has a lot of advantages. Because of its simplicity, it is helpful for everyone in the emergency room. Basis for the procedure are different European guidelines and it's better to use existing and helpful studies than to guess the right doses of fibrinogen or just to reduce this decision on the patient's body weight without including relevant aspects like the extent of trauma and shock. And considering not only the presented data but all knowledge in this field, it is not surprising that the measurement of initial hemoglobin is recommended as indicator for severe bleeding and base deficit measurements should be used to estimate the extent of bleeding. With this algorithm, there's a bridge. A bridge between current scientific knowledge and the real life in hospitals which are involved in the initial treatment of bleeding patients but without the availability of point of care testing. So in conclusion, standard procedures are not only recommended but also helpful if these protocols are established under consideration of local possibilities of material and stuff. An initial concentrate based management without point of care coagulation testing is possible with blood gas analysis which is available in most emergency departments and used by everyone with a great routine and fast results. The combination between this basis for management and a brave simplicity in your algorithm can be useful and help even the youngest colleagues at night. Well, if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to leave a like and in case of any further questions or comments, please write them right below. I hope for further discussions. See ya.